I welcome you all to this 15th lecture program of our ongoing partition lecture series. Today, 13th December 2020, we are organizing the 15th lecture of our ongoing project partition lecture series program. Today, we have with us uh, Dr. Pipa Vardi, uh, Reader, Department of History, D. Montfort University, Leicester, and who have consented to deliver the 15th lecture. We are very grateful to her. But before we uh, introduce her, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to say a few words regarding our works on Bengal Partition Repository, our university, Netaji Shubhash Open University, a brief account of our work I would like to mention. As you might know that Netaji Shubhash Open University is one of the premier open university of India, especially for of Eastern India in terms of enrollment. At present, the university has 4.5 lakhs of students enrolled in PG-13, uh, PG and 15 BDP level courses to second degree program. School of Humanities is an integral part of this open university praxis, which has started a center to contribute more meaningfully into the working praxis of ODL, of our state. The Center for Language, Translation and Cultural Studies, popularly known as CLTCS, has started its journey in 2016 with a project on Indian literature and a subsequent project on Bengal partition. Using the huge network of study centers across the state of West Bengal, this partition project funded by UGC DEB New Delhi has worked to develop a digital repository on Bengal partition on the basis of personal material collected congruent to Bengal partition experience. This is not at all an archive per se, rather we may call it a repository, a repository of personal belongings, writings, mementos and interviews on Bengal partition. After completion of two successive collaborative projects, one is with English discipline Khulna University and other one is Bangladesh Open University, which is also continuing uh, right now. Uh, we have finally succeeded to open this repository in public domain in February 2020 before the COVID-19 outbreak has jeopardized all our on-campus ac academic activity. In sequel to this project activity, we have arranged 14 lectures so far in this series of partition lecture. The project includes uh, field work, workshop, seminar, symposium, etc. There were three international seminar were organized in this connection. Primarily, our main focus is to explore or rather locate the different shades of partition in the rubrics of contemporary socioeconomic milieu of two Bengal, West Bengal and in Bangladesh. But we all know how the partition of our subcontinent is intrinsically associated with the historical studies, memory studies, sociological and psychological studies. However, our project is disposed of Bengal as a center of concern. We are also keen to explore the simultaneity of development that have taken place in other locales as well. Bengali identity in its complex trajectory from 1905 to 1971 can be seen in continuance to the development of Hindu-Muslim relation in collective discourse of Bengali society. So in the Punjabi identity, where the splits have taken place uh, opposite trajectory. Today, the search of Punjabi identity beneath the nation state is also a point of contention in partition studies. We have with us today, Dr. Pipa Vardi, who have researched a lot in this area. Her recent book titled, From the Ashes of 1947, published by Cambridge University Press 2018, is quietly elaborates such inquiry. The language identity and the political idea of nation state are intervened here and paved how uh, it paved the road to present in the Pakistan relation. When I read this book, I was so impressed that uh, I thought that uh, why not we uh, contact and invite her to deliver a lecture in our partition lecture series. Before I introduce her, I would like to quote a passage from the preface of a recent book that I have mentioned here. The book name mentioned that uh, from the ashes of 1947, Reimagining Punjab. In the last para of her preface, he uh, wrote, I quote, the past 10 years, there has been a plethora of material emerging in the partition studies. 
some of this work is concerned with this new approach. Others have continued with the focus of, on the politics. Yet one aspect is clear. There is still an appetite for material and research on partition. This, of course, begs the following questions. Why should this be so? Why, after 70 years of this bittersweet experience of partition and independence, should the people be talking about their memories? The answer partly lies in the lack of closure and understanding of why ordinary people paid such a high price. The history books talk on an organized process controlled by quote unquote great men. Yet few expected the great upheavals, mass dislocation, and the violent response to the drawing up of the boundaries. While both India and Pakistan have engaged in projecting a quote unquote nationalist and thereby providing the arm log ordinary folk with a rationale for why this was necessary. Neither country can truly make come to accept its responsibility and liability in bringing about such carnage and forced migration of millions of people who were uprooted from their homes. I think this is enough. Dr. Pipa Vardi uh, needs no introduction after this book to those who are interested in partition studies of our subcontinent. But here in this arena of Bengali readership, I must mention her academic career and workplace. Dr. Pipa Vardi is presently a reader at De Montfort University, Leicester, United Kingdom, where she teaches modern South Asian history. Her research interest includes British colonial history, history of the Punjab and the South Asian diaspora in Britain and women's writing women's history in modern Pakistan. Here are some list of some of our uh, book publications, recent book publications. Uh, first one is uh, from the ashes of 1947, reimagining Punjab, Cambridge University Press 2018, a refugee and the end of empire, Palgrave Macmillan to 2011, uh, coming uh, to uh, Coventry stories from the South Asian pioneers, Harbour 2006, her recent uh, two or three uh, articles are uh, here. Women in Pakistan, International Airlines in Ayub Khan's Pakistan, published in International History Review 2019. Another one is from uh, Mano Manjra to Fakiranwala, revisiting the train to Pakistan. It, uh, this was jointly uh, written. Arafat Safdar, South Asia Chronicle 2018. She is currently working on a very short introduction to Pakistan Oxford University Press. So let's over to uh, Dr. Pipa Vardi. And again, I congratulate her for uh, accepting our proposal, accepting our invitation to deliver the 15th lecture of our ongoing partition lecture series. Thank you all. Over to Dr. Pipa Vardi. Yes, thank you so much for your kind invitation. And uh, it's an honor to be here to be delivering this uh, lecture. I did have a look at some of the YouTube clips, uh, you know, the former lectures. And it's so good to be speaking on the other side of the border, because often, of course, I'm always um, on the Punjab side of the border. So it's a great honor and a privilege to be speaking um, to an audience which is on the other Border, which, of course, was also equally affected by partition. I mean, for me, I, I, I've spent a lot of time researching years, in fact, working in the area of partition studies. And in fact, you know, one of the things that I've been, uh, I say, privileged, because this is something that not that many scholars have the privilege of being able to do so. Um, but uh, I've had the privilege of being able to uh, spend time, considerable amounts of time um, on both sides of the border uh, to be able to speak to people both in Indian Punjab and Pakistan Punjab and experiences and recording their accounts of 
and memories of their ancestral homelands, um, which of course many of them abandoned. And I should just say uh, very quickly that, you know, there were many accounts where people talked about leaving their homeland, but actually for them, they saw this as a temporary measure, a temporary measure which they thought maybe two, three months down the line when things settled, uh, they would, in fact, uh, come back to those places. But alas, and, and in fact, that uh, quote you read out uh, from the preface, in part, that, that, is the, that refers to that lack of closure, that people were not prepared for this, um, and the fact that they were never able to have any agency in that decision, uh, the fact that they were forced to flee has, has been part of the problem, that there's never been any kind of acknowledgement of closure of this uh, this border. And of course, the, you know, the border very gradually becomes a very hard border, which means that that rupture and that mobility that would have been, you know, at least alleviated some of the pain was not possible either. Um, I'll read out something which um, I've prepared, partly taken from, uh, from the book. And looking at the time, um, what I'll try to do is I'll share some of these thoughts with you. And I've tried to actually, following our kind of conversation, I've tried to focus largely on the issue of language and identity across um, across the Punjab. And if there's time permitting, I'll share some photographs uh, with you at the end as well. Um, but for now, you know, share some uh, ideas and thoughts with you. There are fragments of partitioned lives uh, wherever one goes. Casual conversations inevitably lead to questions of one's background. And then, of course, is the, distinct, is the distinctly unpolished tones of the Punjabi language. They are questions about which one, uh, which side one belongs to. My own identity, as I often have to assert, is Punjabi, and I'm usually immediately placed in the Dwaba area. And thus the familiar tones uh, to the migrants in West Punjab and home in the East Punjab. The Dwaba, you know, dialect is, it, it's very familiar. And of course, you know, the, the migration of people um, is part of the kind of trying to understand how language has been, uh, you know, is located in one, but also travels uh, with that person. So although the person travels, the language also goes with that person. But as a child of the diaspora, my Punjabi is also distinctly untainted by the influences of Arabic, Urdu and Sanskrit, Hindi in modern Pakistan and India. Yet there is immediately a connection uh, with each other, a sense of lost kinship and an awakenedness, uh, you know, in that connection between us. And so the conversation continues to reminisce about lost homes, friends and childhoods abruptly dislocated. The past as many have uh, shared is unalterated, pure and happy until the great Halla or Batwara, the partition, came to shatter the illusion. The new imagined homelands of India and Pakistan are then put under the microscope. Was it worth it? There is a question mark over whether it was worth the loss and why Punjab had to pay a heavy price. And again, you know, I think that question mark um, remains uh, and especially in difficult moments. So, you know, the, the question uh, tends to, I think, um, you know, come to the fore or recede depending on, on current events. And indeed the strange relationship between India and Pakistan for the past 70 years has further embedded this trauma of partition. Although there is still much nostalgia about my city, my street, as testified by Abdul Haq in Lalpur. The hard border between the two countries has made it possible for these forced migrants to revisit their homelands. 
Instead, memories of that lost youth and place have severed to reinforce displacement, loss and anger. Even though some people um, delayed this process for as long as possible, ultimately many had to uh, uh, succumb to this, uh, you know, to this loss, uh, to this forced migration. I apologize for the way I'm speaking, actually. The problem is I've got an ear infection and, um, and, and that's kind of uh, making, uh, making my coordination a little bit difficult uh, at the moment. Um, so, one of the people who, for me, really optimised this uh, uh, sense of displacement and loss was Sarvan Singh. Um, he captures the essence of the issues that have really torn people apart and dislocated them. This was one of the first interviews I did as a PhD student, and the gentle Sardar sitting there cross-legged in his uh, Kapre Wali Dukan uh, selling fabric in Malayal Kotla, uh, in Indian Punjab, had tears running down his eyes. He left an em emotional impression on me. Poignantly, he talks about his village in Pakistan and his yearning to visit his home again, which for forever will remain unfulfilled because he was only too aware um, of the problems of getting uh, a visa. And I share a quote with you from um, Saran Singh. He says, the thing that has affected me the most, which I still yearn for, is the need to go back to my village and have a look. But I am unable to do this. The Lord does not allow me to go back there to my ancestral village and meet my friends and others there. The thing I feel I will be unable to complete in my life. Work is good. But what happened uh, at that time, the things we saw and experienced, and now when I see trouble taking place, then it upsets me. We are settled now, everything is fine. But like I said, I can never compensate for that time, what is in my heart, the thing that I yearn for, to see my house and my friends. And I think with that, many people um, that uh, you know I interviewed vividly remember their homes. And it's worthwhile also mentioning that there is, of course, a class dimension to this as well, because, of course, we've got accounts of, you know, various people who during relaxed times or whether they have the means to uh, get a visa have been able to visit the other side. But for ordinary folk like uh, Saran Singh, he, he, he was only too aware that this was something that was very, you know, impossible for him. And... When they talk about this, they describe their homes in such detail as if an image has been permanently preserved in their memory. Anjali Gera Roy, um, through her project I, at uh, IIT Karpur, spent time with people who drew maps of places, weaving her through the villages, the gullies, the trees to locate their lost homelands. And through these visual recreations, they were able to take her uh, to their former former ancestral homelands. And while people I interviewed have moved on and they have settled down and created new lives, a part of them uh, still yearns for those childhood memories. It was in 2001 when I started my PhD and I was a student of history and with very limited knowledge actually of partition, um, even though you know, I was uh, I was quite aware of the land, but I wasn't aware fully of um, of partition because our family wasn't directly uh, impacted. And despite being closely connected to the land, I think I try to remain an outsider in order to retain a little objectivity, um, especially on embarking um, this journey. <laughs> But through the process of completing this thesis and also then revisiting much of this work, I realized that it left an indelible impression on me and shaped much of my understanding and growing intellectual interest in the, uh, in the idea of Punjabi or Punjabi nurse. Punjab was divided to create the new nation states of India and Pakistan, but the lingering legacy has been one of a communalized and fractured Punjabi identity. The Punjabi Muslim has been absorbed in the Pakistan project and thus hardly speaks his mother tongue, especially the younger generations. 
the Indian Punjabi has been subdivided into the Sikh and the Hindu. And the Sikh and the Punjabi identity has become synonymous to create a Punjabi speaking state and a Hindu Punjab. And the Hindu Punjabi is marginalized out and he has been absorbed into the wider Hindutva project. Punjabis as an ethnic group have therefore been divided and subdivided along religious and then linguistic lines. Punjabi as a language is now almost exclusively associated with the Sikh community, yet it is the mother tongue of most Pakistans today who have adopted Urdu as their national language and thereby creating a new mother tongue. Indeed, in 1948, when Bengali was a majority language in Pakistan, preference was still given uh, to Urdu. And of course, Jinnah famously went to Dhaka in 1948, speaking in English to a Bengali audience and suggesting that Urdu should be their mother tongue. The Hindu Punjabis, on the other hand, associate themselves with Hindi. This, of course, was made easier by a linguistic reorganization of East Punjab. These are simplified stereotypes of the divided people, but more broadly, they're symptomatic of the communalized politics of the subcontinent. And more specifically, they are much more peculiar to the Punjab region. The convergence of different religious practices is evident in the way many people practice faith. And I think recent scholarship has been particularly good at unearthing and uh, documenting these shared religious practices and histories to challenge the otherwise distorted communalized histories. So in a sense, this book is about the transformation of that land, the people, and a dilution of its history, which now tells us a different myth and past of Punjab. It is a revised post-1947 history, which fulfills the national projects of Hindu India and Islamic Pakistan, but fails to adequately acknowledge the shared cultural roots and traditions of a broader Punjabi community. This polarization of people is an attempt to homogenize people and endangers the essence of the plurality which has existed in Punjab for centuries. When I did this uh, project, um, and I, again, I'll share some pictures with you at the end, uh, I focused on two localities, uh, primarily Ludhiana in India, which is the city that I'm from, and Lalpur, um, known as Festival in Pakistan. And both of them have uh, prospered economically in the post-1947 period. They're industrial hubs in both countries. And I also looked at Malay Kotla, which is a Muslim princely state and was surrounded by the Sikh states in, uh, in East Punjab. And so I told um, or I tell this story primarily through these areas, but also um, I've tried to focus on women and their experience, which uh, experiences which are often forgotten in these um, contributions and especially their contribution to making modern India and Pakistan. So while the partition of Punjab addressed the needs of the Muslims of India, or British India, I should say, the territorial division itself has created a much more unintended outcome, that of a communalized and fractured post-colonial Punjabi identity. Punjab was made up of three main communities, Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, and of course, a smaller number of other minorities. Safar Rama powerfully argues that the Muslim, Hindu, Sikh mix in Punjabi society ceased to exist once Punjab was divided. 1947 partition and subsequently the linguistic reorganization and further division of East Punjab in 1966 has created territories which are now associated with the three unmixed religious communities. Thus, Pakistan Punjab is predominantly Muslim, Indian Punjab is dominated by the Sikhs, and Haryana and Himachal, previously part of East Punjab, now dominated by the Hindus. Post-1947 Punjabs today reflect the fault lines created in colonial India and remain divided religiously and linguistically. 
Academic discourse, unfortunately, tends to remain divided too, but recent research has begun uh, to challenge this dominant discourse of Punjabi society that is still quite complex given the huge population transfers that have taken place. What is interesting in the case of East and West Punjab is how both areas uh, drop reminders of the division from their name and retained only Punjab. In order to create new histories and new reimagined homelands, East Punjab was simply known as Punjab from 1950. And although West Punjab remained until the emergence of the one unit in 1955, it was mostly the shortened version of Punjab that was used from, 1950s, uh, from the 1950s onwards. And compare this with Bengal, of course, Bangladesh aside, West Bengal has retained the stark reminder that there was once another half. And of course, it's interesting and, you know, telling of the uh, times that this reminder now has also been erased in West Bengal. By erasing the West and the East, both Punjabs have sought to erase a past history and create a new homeland, which is the primary identity that has, that is religion. Um, and I think one of the, I mean, when we look at, um, it, you know, in terms of looking yeah. at the ethnic group, one of the kind of most important features of that ethnic group, of course, is language, uh, not religion, but language. And it binds and brings the cultural history of those people together to fo form a cohesive group of people with a shared sense of its past, Punjabi, interestingly, was never given state uh, patronage. This is true for the Mughal period, Ranjit Singh's reign, and also under the British. The preferred state or official language was Persian and Urdu. Farina Mir argues that part of the problem under the British was the polarity of the scripts that were used to write Punjabi. All three scripts, Indo-Persian, Gurmukhi, and Nagri, were used but none of them dominated. Yet despite this anomaly, Punjabi continued to be the language of the masses and reached into wider Punjab from Peshawar to Delhi, albeit in different dialects, but broadly comprehensible. The work of Christopher Shackle is also worth mentioning. He wrote Punjabi in Lahore in 1970, drawing on the Muslim Punjabi literary tradition. And this, of course, is um, important, uh, particularly when we look at, you know, small um, uh, Punjabi, uh, Muslim Punjabi nationalists today, particularly who reach to this, um, uh, you know, sense of um, Punjabi nationalism through its literary tradition. But it is the plurality in the written Punjabi that causes friction and provides the space for further divisions in the post-colonial context. It is within this milieu that the language, the people and the land become further subdivided to reflect both national and in the case of six, subnational identities. This produces three distinct outlooks, which Vrinda Kalra outlines as Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan, Urdu, Muslim, Pakistan, and Punjabi, Sikh, and Khalistan. The Hindu Punjabi has therefore been absorbed into this Hindutva project. The Muslim Punjabi has abandoned the Punjabi language in favor of the more Islamic, Urduized identity. And interestingly, it is the Punjabi owning and speaking Sikhs who have become synonymous with the Punjab and the Punjabi identity. Yet in reality, it is also the mother tongue of the majority of Pakistanis and non-Sikh Punjabis in India. I think, you know, here it's kind of also worthwhile sort of just drawing those parallels. Again, I, you know, when I mentioned that Jinnah in 1948 goes to Dhaka to say that Urdu is going to be the mother tongue of Pakistan. I think, you know, one of the kind of aversions, of course, of a Bengali was also partly to do with the way Bengali was written in, uh, in East Pakistan, because, of course, it was uh, seen to be too... Uh, Sanskritized.
So these, you know, the questions of language and script are important here in forming a connection um, and creating a new nation state. So the connection of language and religion has therefore come to define the post-colonial landscape in Punjab. Tariq Rahman has shown how soon after the creation of Pakistan, Punjab vanished as a university subject because of its association with Sikhs and due to the state's promotion of Urdu, Punjabi was relegated to the periphery. In fact, it is difficult to think of another region in the subcontinent that has shunned its linguistic and ethnic history in favor of a national or religious identity. The pluralistic land of Punjab that optimized people like my parents' generation are fewer and fewer. My father's generation is hardly to be found in the Indian Punjab today. As a child, I never found it strange that my father made most of his notes in the Indo-Persian script, despite being a Sikh. As Ajay Badwaj shows, in East Punjab, Urdu became, um, sorry, I should say that as Ajay Badwaj also notes, in East, Pakistan, uh, East Punjab, Urdu also became a casualty of Punjabi. The prescriptive orthodoxy symbolizing Sikhism today is also unfamiliar to many, including myself. In fact, my mother, who was a practicing Sikh, also embraced other practices to optimize the pluralistic tendencies associated in the Punjab that I'm familiar with. Similarly, Bhagwaj has also tried to unearth some of these hidden histories of a composite Punjab, which belies the dominant narrative. And he recalls the story, and I quote Ajay, uh, Ajay's work here. Behind my grandparents' house um, in our village, Akalgar, in district Madhyana, in a narrow street, to this day, it is called Rajputa Digali the street of the Rajputs. This is where the influential community of the Rajput Muslims, as they were addressed, lived before partition. The villagers reference to the Masita Wala uh, Gudwara, literally the mosque behind uh, turned Gudwara, is yet another symbol of the once powerful presence of Muslims in Akalgar. Similarly, there is a pond called Tarusha Katob, named after the wandering Fakir Tarusha, who preferred to stay in, uh, stay on in our village. Over the years, his shrine in the old graveyard has grown in size and stature, yet there are no Muslims in the village. And I would echo that because you can find many of these kind of places um, in, um, certainly I'm familiar of them in Jalandhar, including, um, including my, um, you know, and, uh, the village my dad belonged to as well, where you have a Sufi shrine side by side, a uh, historic Gudwara. And often people who go and do a manat at the Gudwara will also visit the Sufi shrine as well. So partition has enabled this rewriting of history that is now constructed through a lens that is linear and monoreligious in its outlook. Both India and Pakistan have been trying to erase and rewrite their shared past. The fo forced migration resulted in the separation of people and lasted a few months. But the project to write these histories has been complex and subtle. Janjit Man, in her recent project, has been ex exploring this cultural amnesia towards contested sites and how Sikh and Muslim sites coexist in post-1947 along the Grand Trunk Road. Retelling this story in the post-1947 Punjab also means erasing other histories. But as Ajay Bardwaj highlights, these new imagined localities still retain a, con a connection with its previous history, despite renaming of places. For example, in Lalpur, an old, um, old Sikh uh, localities are still known as Gurnanakpura and Gurgobindpura, despite the outmigration of all the Sikh community. Similarly, in Ludhiana, you can still find places like Sufiyanwala Chong, or Shwani Mahla, um, which were uh, popular places uh, for Muslims uh, prior to 1947. Mm -hmm. 
Malhotra and Mir's work tries to delve into some of these complexities which have shaped contemporary Punjabs. Memory and nostalgia for a glorious past continues to resonate beyond the divided boundaries as they note and quote, for many of Partition's refugees, while the physical relationship with the land people was irrevocably lost, their Punjab would live, live on in their imaginaries and in the new world they constructed for themselves. End of quote. For example, names uh, given to refugee colonies of Delhi, Gujranwala, Bera, or Punjabi Bagh, or the other in um, uh, is which is often a conversation uh, opener is quote to see Pichokitova, where are you from? Which is a clear reference to where you came from before partition, Picho, which is you know an invitation from before. Naming places from former villages, towns, and cities helps embed and memorialize the past in the present. It is a form of preserving our own history despite new borders. And while East and West Punjab have erased um, this reminder, people still memorialize their past histories in these small but significant ways. This, of course, is contrary to what has been happening at the national level in both India and Pakistan, where both countries have been busy erasing colonial place names and renaming them with their heroes from a mythical past and resisting any challenge uh, to current state narratives. A good example of this is the resistance campaign to have Shad Chonk in Lahore to be renamed Bhagat Singh Chonk to commemorate the revolutionary hero of undivided Punjab and the place where he was hanged. In contemporary Punjabs, and that's the plural Punjabs, an atheist like Bhagat Singh has increasingly become a contested figure for those who want, who want to own him. And it's interesting how, you know, everyone wants to own uh, a part of Bhagat Singh. Um, recently, uh, Chris Moffat has uh, has written um, about Bhagat Singh. So if you're interested, it's worthwhile looking at that work. So going back to Ajay, who actually is a documentary filmmaker, he's been attempting to capture this hazy space of shared and composite culture of Punjab in his films. He captures the voices of a marginalized idea of a Punjab youth a Punjabiness, especially through language, which becomes replaced by contending identities through the establishment of two new nation states. In his film, Milange Baba Ratna De Melete, Let's Meet a Baba Ratna's Ratna's Fair, Birdwatch takes you uh, through a journey that pieces together remnants of a pre-partition Punjab in which identities were fluid and people blended together in fairs and Sufi shrines. And more re uh, recently, Yogesh Seni has been exploring the lives of two Sufi shrines in East Punjab, which remain peripheral in otherwise dominant discourses. These are small attempts to recover these lost spaces and traditions in order to bring them into the mainstream. Their work alludes to the presence of the past in the present. I'm going to just uh, finish uh, this part um, with the words um, of Balraj Sani, who some of you might be familiar with, uh, was a prominent Indian actor and also a migrant from Ralpindi. And I'm going to read out his uh, poem in translation, um, which I think, um, you know, um, it, it, it's, it has very powerful words. It was written during his visit to Amritsar in 1951, and it draws on much of the pain and the loss associated with partition. You are those with a country. You are those with homes. We are homeless. We are estranged. You smiled and took us to your breast. We cried and took consolation. The faded stars twinkled once again. What we did not hope for was made possible by your warmth. May my city live and its people thrive. We came 
and pray for this we have now depart. All our pockets are empty. We carry nothing with us as we leave. Half a heart repines here. Half a heart lies neglected there. The paths for which our hearts once beat, for these paths we became strangers. What of our becoming human beings? We have all turned into Hindus, Sikhs and Muslims. And I'll finish uh, speaking there and I am going to turn to, uh, I'm going to try to share a screen with you, which has, um, so I just wanted to show you also this um, area, just so that you have a sense of Punjab and also particularly looking at where Ludhiana and Lalpur are uh, located. So this is undivided Punjab, and then you have the Radcliffe line. And then if you just focus on the eastern side, then you can see how it is then further subdivided. And you can see that the East Punjab of today is a is a much smaller entity um, from uh, from before. And just a few pictures also from uh, from the border. Um, this is from uh, Atari, the check uh, check post, which was built in 1949. But actually, this doesn't exist anymore. Um, I was there, I think it was uh, two years ago, possibly now. And uh, they were doing a lot of construction around the border. And this checkpoint was actually destroyed in the process. So that's a kind of an interesting, um, you know, um, when you think about the kind of erasing of history, not that, you know, I'm fond of this border, but uh, it just shows you how, um, you know, these things, um, um, uh, you know, are, don't hold much uh, sway in, uh, in both countries. And this is the border. From, this is from the Indian side, looking, um, looking towards the uh, Pakistan and you can see again a lot of construction work going on there and this is an older picture actually because the border doesn't look like this anymore particularly if you look at the coolies who've got produce on their head and walking the, it used to be possible many years ago to just simply walk across the border and in the distance you see a kind of a barrier and on the side where you see a lot of the greenery, that's where the colonial bungalows used to be. And that was the effectively the checkpoint. It has now become a far more elaborate, uh, you know, um, uh, endeavor. And it's almost like a kind of an airport style, you know, in terms of the Im immigration and the customs. And this is the ceremony. Um, this is actually from the Indian side. This was done on Republic Day a few years ago. And of course, it was, you know, um, a lot more uh, elaborate than it uh, normally is. Um, this is at, uh, you know, the sunset. And this is uh, actually from the other border, the Gundasing uh, border, um, which is a, a, you know, which isn't normally open to tourists. Um, but I had the, well, I was able to visit this actually from uh, from the Pakistan side. So this, and actually allows you very close um, viewing um, of what goes on. So it's less elaborate, it's not open to, um, uh, to tourists, and you can really get quite up close, but there's still this kind of dramatic uh, ceremony that goes on at Gundasing, um, and these pictures are from there. And again, this is, um, uh, you know, um, another picture from uh, that, uh, that side of the border. And you can see the, you know, the in terms of the display 
of uh, valor, strength, military, might, um, very masculine spaces as well. Um, it, you know, perhaps we can have a discussion about this. And outside the formal spaces of Vaga Atari, you sort of also see, you know, images like this. Um, you know, I, I asked them if they could stand and pose for me and both of them obliged. And it has to be remembered also that beyond the ceremony that goes on at the border, that actually it is a rehearsed exercise. So outside that formal space, they do spend time together rehearsing mm. this ceremony. And so the people mm. posted, you know, the border security force and um, the Pakistani Rangers, they do get to know each other uh, quite well. And I've got another colleague of mine. Um, I know, Professor Mundal, you mentioned uh, William Shand uh, Van Shandel's work of uh, the Bengal borderlands. Um, Ilyas Jatta is actually working on the, on the Punjab borderlands in terms of the kind of porous nature of uh, that border and the kind of activities that were taking place um, following um, uh, partition. So this is uh, work I hope that uh, should come out next uh, next year. So I, I mentioned that you know there's uh, there's been a lot of construction work going on, and uh, you can see that you know this ceremony rather than sort of disappearing is only becoming more and more uh, uh, elaborate because they've built these huge amphitheaters at the border and both of them, um, you know, have been sort of doing this kind of one um in terms of uh, making it more and more uh, elaborate. And there is also, uh, I haven't seen this recently, but uh, amongst all the work that was going on, but there used to be this a very small uh, memorial, um, you know, dedicated to the 10 lakh Punjabis who died unsung in 1947. And this was done by a small independent folklore research academy based in Chandigarh. Uh, you know, they uh, put some money together and made this small memorial to commemorate those people. And I mentioned how, you know, in um, you can often find uh, these place names. These are just uh, some of the ones I wanted to share with you. You can see Laupur Suites um, in the back there. This is located in uh, in Ludhiana. And similarly, you can find Ludhiana Suites in um, in Laupur, uh, which is a small Matiai Wali Dukan. And you see this Karyana store, uh, there's Lalpur uh, Emporium there in Ludhiana and the uh, Ludhiana store there in Lalpur. So these are just, you know, uh, a few of the ways in which they've kind of preserved these. This was a kind of an interesting place. I want to write a little bit more about this. This is Cafe 1947. This is located, and if you look um, carefully, in the corner you can see Minare Pakistan uh, just shining um, in the background. So this is located not far from uh, where Jinnah made his 1942 nation uh, theory speech. Um, where Manare Pakistan is uh, in Minto Park and close by you've uh, what they've done is they've created almost kind of like an amusement uh, place in the park and this cafe is located there this is a fairly new construction and this is also you know um uh, this is taken from uh, Iftikhar Dadi's uh, and Hamad Nasser's uh, edit edited book, Lines of Control, Partition as a Productive Space. And I think it sort of captures, there is perhaps no border outside, uh, out, border outpost in the world quite like Vaga, the border between India and Pakistan, an outpost where every evening people are drawn to a thin white line and probably any one in the eye of the conflict could find him or yeah. herself there. Of course, this is a slightly old in the sense that it was possible to do that. Now, of course, um, they've created physically also a bit more distance uh, between that line of control. 
Um, but art, of course, is a, you know, and particularly this, uh, I wanted to share with you ways in which artists have also tried to uh, capture that. And I'm going to leave you with these two pictures. Uh, these were taken by me. Um, the barbed wire is in Amritsar, the Partition Museum. And the birds are in uh, Lahore, in uh, Model Town, which was a colonial uh, construction. Um, and initially I was playing around with the idea of using uh, these pictures somehow in, uh, on the cover of my book. And it was an attempt really for me to capture that lack of closure associated with partition. Uh, the pictures are made up of two pictures taken in the space of a few days, one in Lahore and one in Amritsar, two cities separated by only a few kilometers, but otherwise separated by an international border and a plethora of paperwork needed to meet the requirements of getting a visa to visit the other. For the ordinary Indians and Pakistanis, this is either impossible or highly problematic. For the foreigners, this is in the realm of possibility. The fuzzy barbed wire represents these harsh borders that exist uh, between the two countries. Yet there is also some hope and opportunity in the birds seeking to fly away. Each looking to escape to a new pastures, they know of no territorial borders or boundaries. The small gaps between the barbed wire also offer small opportunities through which we can communicate and maintain some dialogue. And I'll stop there.